Virginia. No. My name is John Carter. Hello, lovelies. So I got a nice shiny new game in the post. Um, Modiphius is John Carter of Mars, the Barsoom RPG. Um, you may remember the film that was around uh, recently that didn't do too well, which is a damn shame because it was a good film. Um, I have it on Blu-ray. I backed the Kickstarter for this, so I have a few extra bits and bobs. Um, there's miniatures for it as well, there's a skirmish game, all, all that kind of stuff. They, they've gone kind of all out with this, so I hope it does well for them. I've always liked Pulp. A lot of game designers like Pulp. But it's never really caught the attention or wholesale interest of the role-playing market for some reason. Um, the closest it got to any kind of real success, I suppose, would be Spirit of the Century, but that compromised so many core tenets of, of Pulp that I don't know that it can be considered... Uh, really to, to be in the pulp tradition. Um, there was also part of the whole um, White Wolf superhero thing that they did, which was uh, Adventure, I think. I can't, I can't remember exactly. That never took off particularly, but those are the closest we've got to to real pulp successes, I suppose. Um, there was a noir RPG that was quite good, but massively overlooked by a lot of people. Unfortunately, that was good for playing like a Sin City style game, but but still, Pulp has never really taken off. So, the film didn't do too well, and here's the game largely derived uh, from the film. They're still trying to push that via John Carter for some reason. I think this is the logo from the um, re-releases of the original novels. The original novels were written uh, back in the 19th century through to the through to the beginning of the 20th century and they're all very high adventure science fantasy very much of their time um, so I was curious to see how they would approach that in this game how they would get the look and feel and how they would translate the novels through to the game so yeah, this is the nice shiny slipcase edition. So let's get the books out. Now while the slipcase is landscape, the books themselves, sorry, while the book, while the slipcase is portrait, the books themselves are landscape format. Best get that the right way around, otherwise I look like an idiot. Um, so the slipcase comes with a campaign guide, Phantoms of Mars, and the main book. That's a nice little doobree there. The artwork on the covers and through much of the interior is reminiscent of Michael Whelan's covers, uh, a subject to which we will <laughs> we will return later. Um, on the covers, I think they're reasonably effective, but the influence of the film and of modern sensibilities is very much present um, in the art direction, in the styling. It's not necessarily a good thing. I was curious, given the slightly more adult approach that they took with their Conan game, even though I didn't feel that mechanically it was, it was particularly good, or whether they would represent Mars as it is written, or whether they'd represent it in other ways. And they definitely seem to have taken the cues more from the film and there's probably a great deal of oversight on a license like this um, to operate according to certain parameters. Barsim itself is in a kind of weird situation because two-thirds of it are, are public domain now, but ERB Inc., um, the people who continue to monitor the, the properties and so on are extremely litigious. At one point I was looking to do a Barsoom game because it was public domain uh, but it rapidly became apparent uh, even though I wasted some money on art and so on. This is uh, right back when I started so this is 2002-ish I was looking into this. But it rapidly became apparent that they were so litigious that it was just not going to be worth my while even trying. Um, 
so uh, yeah suffice to say this isn't the approach that, that I would necessarily have taken but um, let's have a look inside okay so this is the main game book John Carter of Mars adventures on the dying world of Barsim Modiphius using their 2d20 system which I'm not a fan of Modiphius are a very workmanlike company they seem to have all these licenses they, they're the, the current license grabber uh, which seems to be a, a publication model that a lot of RPG companies, particularly in the UK, have gone, gone for. Uh, Mongoose Publishing, in particular, back in, back in the day, during the heights of D20, uh, they were the license kings. They would go after anything um, to, get, to get a license for it. Uh, Modiphius seemed to be the, the modern equivalent. And this is going to be awkward because the size isn't particularly helpful. Let me just try and line this up so you can see better. Okay, so end papers, you've got the, the maps of Barsoom, front and rear. But yeah, there's plenty of terra incognita and secret places and other ways you can go about doing things. You don't have to really stick to the background um, as it stands. Now, the print quality is really good. It's like um, art book print quality. But the paper is rather thin, um, and I felt really kind of self-conscious leafing through this book of how fragile the, the paper felt. Um, I'm not sure whether such thin paper is going to stand up too well to repeated use and leafing through. So in order to preserve what is a really nice book, uh, even with a little cloth page marker, what I would suggest anyone does is that they only use it when preparing for games and that they copy out the rules and things that they need and print them out and carry them around separately because with heavy use I really get the feeling that this book is gonna is gonna suffer either from oily fingers smudging the fairly heavy ink or just wear and tear on the pages so that's what I, I would worry about now I was expecting there to be some kind of disclaimer um, about when the books were written and the suggestiveness and the gender politics and so on because that's the world we live in and I'm actually really pleased that they didn't even address it uh, one way or the other. I mean, they talk in fairly glowing terms about it all. Maybe that was part of the um, part of the deal when it came to the license that they couldn't say anything negative about it. But the enthusiasm does come out of the come out of the writing. They do talk about Edgar Rice Burroughs, his his history, the things that he did, the Barsoom novels. There's hints towards uh, the Venus novels and the, and the rest of it that he did. They kind of set out the base storytelling elements of the world romance and rationalism what pulp is explain their terms in terms of presenting what Barsoom is what the books were how they were presented and so on how you can replicate that in your games the advice seems you know, pretty good really uh, there's the inevitable different time measurements and distance measurements there um, all the usual kinds of advice. Now what is interesting is they've divided it into eras of play. Um, so when John Carter first gets to Mars, the kind of uh, conflicts where he's in charge of Helium, the, the main city on Mars of the Red Martians, um, and the Jeddak of Jeddak's era, the kind of tail end of it all. What's missing is a more modern spin. Um, yeah, it's been a long time since the last Barsian book was written. What has happened in the interim? What is what is opened up for players and GMs to actually do in the intervening seventy odd years, seventy plus years? You know, things change, things happen. We've sent probes to Mars since then. What what's happened since then? Is there some kind of big cover up or something? That's missing, uh, and that's. An idea that really appeals to me. 
um, as as something to explore. So maybe I guess I'll just write up those campaign notes for myself and maybe make them available to someone. Characters are fairly shallow. It's not a particularly granular system. There's not scope for a huge amount of customization. All your statistics start at four and then get shifted by templates according to race and so on. Um, and then there's career types and talents, which are kind of like special abilities and so on. So there's some degree of customization, but there just isn't the, the granularity and scope within the system to make your character stand out really well mechanically. It will have to come through in your roleplay. So if you really like tweaking and fiddling with your, with your characters and optimizing or using the statistics and so on to represent the individuality of your character, that's not really going to be here for you. And I, that's uh, a criticism of the 2D20 system as a, as a whole, I think, but it's, it's particularly apparent in this. Um, rather than give you lists and lists of talents, they have kind of opened it up for you to create your own, um, which is nice to see, but I would have liked more examples, I think. Uh, as we move through this, you can see that the art is okay, but it doesn't really stand out on most of the pieces. I'm gonna... The depictions of the clothing and so on is definitely on the more conservative movie end especially for the uh, female characters that are displayed because in the books everyone is essentially naked on Mars they just wear jeweled harnesses and, and, and things um, now I can understand why they might shy away from that but yeah, I'd rather see more commitment to canon and uh, of course it uses novelty dice fuck novelty dice. You don't have to use novelty dice, you can just use standard d6s and figure out what the effects are, but uh, unless you buy the novelty dice that's rapidly going to become annoying, I think. I really hate this trend in gaming for novelty dice, it just pisses me off so much because once a game goes out of print, once the, you know, the dice dry up, the production run, what, what are you supposed to do? Fantasy Flight are much worse for this, but Modiphius have done that too. Uh, system's kind of interesting, I guess. So whenever you roll, it's compared against two things, and a roll under the highest thing gives you one success, and a roll under the lowest thing gives you two successes. So if you had, say, 11 and four as your stats or whatever it is that you're that you're rolling on and you rolled your two dice and you got a ten and a three that would be a total of three successes you can get additional dice these are the the d20s um, for, for various things like luck or situational bonuses thing, things like that and you get momentum which is kind of similar to uh, the sort of rolling advantage that you get in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, so, and that kind of replicates the the way in which one thing leads to another in the in the pulp novels. So that's that's interesting. That's good. That's that's genre emulation, I think, and uh, yeah, not not a bad thing at all. Combat kind of takes. Um, take some cues from things like Feng Shui and, and so on where you've got different levels of baddie so you've got your minions, your your mooks and your bosses <laughs> essentially combat doesn't feel particularly deadly between main characters which I guess is okay but is much more deadly with minions um, it seems to be a common thing in Modiphius's games that combat doesn't necessarily feel deadly enough while while you're doing it. Um, the Dust Adventures didn't use this system; uh, it used an entirely different system. But that it felt difficult to hurt anybody 
And uh, while I haven't played this, I did run out a couple of little scenarios and um, two characters against each other, or a hero and a villain I should say, does feel a little uh, slow and off. Perhaps um, the GM gets threat as well, so people can choose to take penalties in order to gain additional dice, and what that does is that gives the, the Games Master more scope to have their villains manage things and get away with things and so on. The lack of granularity makes the, the weapons not exactly massively fascinating or interesting or mechanically differentiated from one another. Um, I just want to briefly talk about the art again, but I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, reputation is important here, and the kind of values of the pulp era very much come through. So. I think this is going to appeal to some old school gamers and those who are heavily into the pulps, uh, the whole pulp revival thing, because it does project those values. It doesn't try to be postmodern, it doesn't try to deconstruct and rebuild um, the pulp world. It's, it's very faithful to the kind of ethos um, present in the books, which is appealing to, to a lot of people. <sighs> I mean, the, the art, I, I can't decide whether I like it or not, really. Things are a lot more covered up. I do have to wonder how much of that is the, is the licensing agreement. Again, I would have rather seen something faithful to the books. And I'm not sure whether it's the printing or the art, but the, the art just doesn't pop. It's, it seems like there's not enough contrast between light and dark and everything just kind of becomes slightly muddy some pieces it still works others just it makes the detail disappear I think and it just makes it muddy and, and flat which is really unfortunate because Barsim should be massively colorful and engaging some pieces it is other pieces it, it, it isn't yeah, you know, the background information's all there about the, the green Martians, the different races. It kind of skims over some of the nastier aspects of some of them a, a bit, I think, and does tend to fixate on the red Martians, which I think it's assumed that you will be um, you'll be interacting with the most. Uh, obviously, you can play a human who has ended up on Mars by a, one means or another and you get these special abilities from that, though they're not as game-breakingly powerful um, as they would be in a, in a purely honest translation. But you can bounce around and you do have higher strength, just not to the extent that is shown um, in the film, for example. But you know, there's, there's plenty of background here. It's a good summary and if it's not enough, or you feel that something's missing or has been sanitized a bit there's um, there's plenty you can go and look at online there's plenty of wikis on on Barsoom uh, briefly talk about the other planets I'm hoping they do a Carson of Venus supplement for it at some point uh, so then you got your narrator advice um, secrets a bestiary all this kind of thing and a couple of um, sample adventures yeah, you can see what I mean. Her, her tits should be on show, strictly by canon, and his shot, his, his cock should be swinging in the breeze, <laughs> as well. I can understand to an extent, but I can't decide whether they've gone too far on the censorship. Um, circumstances. It's, it looks like it's suitable as a starting RPG for people, though I doubt it will be for many people. I guess there might be a few really big Barsoom fans who might pick up the game out of a sense of completeness for their collection and might end up role-playing via that but uh, yeah we'll see there's some wider words about planetary romance and uh, gore is a planetary romance just saying uh, it might be interesting to do a conversion uh, for, from these rules to that though gore's written a bit grittier um, than, than Barsoom is so you've got a bestiary of all the kinds of creatures you might you might expect or remember. Now in particular, I want to pause here at the Bants. 
because the Banths are very much inspired by Michael Whelan's work on the covers. These recognisably so, particularly the the roaring beast here. Now, these are kind of Martian lions, sort of, uh, by some descriptions. Quite vicious and nasty. But this calls to mind uh, Whelan's cover to I think it's Thuvia Made of Mars, where she's standing next to a next to a Banth. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, that brings up the, the, the censorship issue. See, on the original cover that Whelan produced, you've got Thuvia standing there, leaning against the Banth, one arm on it, with her bare ass <laughs> pointing out, out of the page towards you. Now, the publisher had some uh, misgivings about having a bare bottom on the cover. <laughs> Quite why, I don't know. I guess this was the, the, the first flush of more militant feminism uh, when he was redoing those covers. I think it was the 80s. It may have been the late 70s, but, but still. So what he did was he painted some purple panties on her in a paint that he could later wipe off to re-reveal <laughs> the bare ass. So Whelan dealt with censorship in a, in a defiant way here they have sanitized it and it uh, it doesn't seem like the panties rub off shall we say uh calot that's kind of like a martian dog sort of but um very very quick and fast you may remember that from the cartoonish speed in the film but there's, there's plenty of stuff here for you to you to play around with and the thing about Mars is there's so much unknown so much weird so much strange that it's very easy for you to bring in something else make up something your own monsters your own beasts your own whatever some of these could be retooled as player characters fairly easily judging by the attributes because you can take these as being average examples of their kind and then you can look at the statistics and see what's higher what's what's lower and so on and it should be very easy for you to translate for example the synthetic men into full-blown characters other monsters perhaps not so much or to just boost their stats to make them heroic or alpha examples of, the, of their kind uh, so yeah they have general general rules for making up your own kinds of monsters um, which is which is useful um, not everything is presented in the player section, so there's some secrets, even though they're out in the books and to an extent in the film, that departs from the books. Um, so that more secret information, the rarer species, the more peculiar examples, those are found there. The various locations, but again, I think Burroughs never really focused on any single place other than Helium, for the most part, perhaps the Danga in, in the books. So these are all places that kind of John Carter visited once, fucked up severely, and then moved on. So there's no reason why you can't do that yourself. Uh, some notes on Martian technology, uh, yeah, and the characters from the books from the various eras: Deja Torres, John Carter, Cantos Can, Sola. And yeah, and and so it goes, and so it goes, and so it goes. So if you wanted to play the the heroes or involve the villains from the history of the books, you've got plenty there. Um, and there's some basic uh, generic baddies that you can use as well. Uh, and then the people who backed the book for a lot of money get their own special characters in there so uh, that's that's pretty much it as far as the main book goes so to summarize I suppose it's a very simple system um, one without much in the way of granularity so in terms of character customization or equipment customization and so on it's not really a lot to be done there um, as far as the 2d20 system goes I think they've managed to adapt it fairly well to the setting but it's far from perfect. It's just it's just workmanlike. It do, it does the job. But they really seem wedded to this two D twenty system, and I can't say I particularly understand why. 
um, other than it being their house system, I guess, and they can refine it with each release. So you've got a campaign guide then, as the second book. Um, they already had an introductory adventure in the main book, um, but it is <sighs> adventures never sell well. Um, I've done surprisingly well with the Korean adventures. I was very surprised that they did well, but I've tried to make them provide more than just the adventure. They're useful in understanding the application of the rules as the designers intend. That's yeah, and the and the game world that the that the uh, that the writers that the, the, the developers intend. That's what it's useful for. So an introductory adventure can be useful. I just kind of view this as being more of that, um, more than anything else. So I'm just going to skim over this. They do have the skirmish rules um, in the back of here. So if you get some miniatures and you want to play more of a skirmish battle game, um, you can do that here. You won't have to have to buy anything extra for that. Though I think they're doing that game separately as well. Now as bonus stuff I got a map of Barsoom. This is the same map that's in the end papers but it's not as, as dark red. You can make things out better. That's quite nice. I'll probably go on a wall somewhere. And then on the back uh, you've got the city of Korad. So I got two of those because I figured one can get mangled travelling back and forth to where I came and uh, the other one can stay safe and pristine. Now they got tile maps for use with miniatures. Um, I didn't open these yet and I'm not going to just yet, but they do seem quite sturdy and the artwork seems seems good enough. We've got airships and ruins, which seem to me to be the most likely places uh, that minis might be needed. And I may pick up some of the minis, though I'm not particularly good at painting them anymore. One thing I thought was really interesting was these cards that they've produced to go with it. Now these represent places. This is an idea I had, which clearly they stole from me, to have locations in a, in a game world as art cards that you could perhaps lay out or shuffle and use as inspiration for adventures. So each one has the image on one side, the description from the other in somewhat purple prose. Um, and it's just it's just a really nice inspirational thing or a thing to show the players to to tell them what's there to give them a sense of the atmosphere and so on and like I said it's an idea I had years ago but could never follow up on because I didn't have the money but it's something I would have liked to have done um, yeah there's, there's there's plenty here air battles ruins um, wilderness you know it's all useful inspiration and ways to show the players you know what location they're in what they can see sometimes description just isn't enough or you need a, a visual cue to help the players understand where they are what's going on what the atmosphere is and as such I think these are a good innovation uh, of course I do it was my idea <laughs> uh, but we'll see whether whether they continue to do this. All things considered then, um, I think it's a solid workmanlike system. I think the way it represents Boris's work and the pulp genre and so on is um, almost reverential, really. Um, yeah, I like all that aspect of it. The artwork is okay but not brilliant and not quite as um, canonical as I would have preferred, though I understand their reasons. Um, it's, it's a solid game, it's just not remarkable. So if I was to score it, I would give it a 4 out of 5 for style. I think the presentation in the slipcase and the artwork overall and so on is good, but I dock it a point for the muddiness and so on and in terms of substance I would also give it a four I think just doesn't 
necessarily quite go into enough depth on some things um, but I guess they're leaving that for supplementary material and I also feel that the modern era is is a glaringly obvious missing part here but this may all come down to licensing agreements and so on I, I just I can't know so that's um, four and four for a grand total of four out of five it's it's a good game it's worth picking up if you're a fan of pulp a fan of Barsoom a fan of John Carter the, the film it manages to make the 2d20 system more pulpy even more so than their Conan game I think it's just I wanted more four out of five is still a really good score mm, possibly it's more of a 3.5 but it is worth getting, I think, and worth supporting, and I wish Modiphius all the luck in the world with it. Zang. Let them be crushed like unhatched eggs. <laughs> <laughs>